All right, so this is a, the third video in uh, the series in which uh, Ryan's going to talk about the quadrant model of reality and explain it for, for everyone that does know, including me, because I'm very much a layman. So where do you want to start off, Ryan? So we started off talking about this is going to be the third quadrant thinker, doer, motor, dreamer, right. the fourth quadrant kind of plater, passion, flowing, knowing. Mm -hmm. Um. But we ended off, we were talking about gases, liquids, solids, plasmas, and we talked about wind, water, earth, fire. I actually forgot to mention that every culture, almost every culture also has a fifth one. And remember, I described how there's these four qualities, and the fifth quality is always extremely, you remember the fifth is always extremely transcendent. So the fourth is a transcendent, but the fifth is really out there. So uh, Aristotle in Plato, they said that this fourth or this fifth one is the ether, and they describe that the ether is in the stars, and they say that it um, causes everything to be this ether. Now, the Japanese they said that the fifth one is the void. Um, and different groups have you mean, you mean like Taoism? Is that what you're talking about? I'm not really sure because I'm, I'm not sure I've heard of that. Well, different groups said different things, but I think it was some some sh Japanese group said. Uh, I guess the Japanese said the fifth one was the void. I could be wrong. Okay. Well. But my we'll point see. my point is <laughs> it doesn't really matter. The point is that these groups recognized the fifth that was extremely transcendent. And Aristotle says that the fifth one... Right, so transcendent, it's like invisible. Like you don't, you can't even really, you can only infer its existence from what you um, can see, which is the, a combination of the other four. It's beyond this realm of experience. Um, right. And that's what you mean by transcendent. Yeah. Okay. And, <clears throat> you know, Aristotle said that it's a mixture of hot, moist, cold, and dry. So oh, it's a gee. mixture of all of them together. Let's see. Yeah, I don't even know what that could be like. Yeah. It's beyond my ability to... It's beyond imagine. rational comprehension. Right. So, I, I wanted to just mention that before we continued. We left off talking about carbon and silicone. Um, and it talked about how these are the miracle elements. They look like quadrants. Um, pr pretty much most everything in our realm of experience is made up of carbon and silicone. Our earth, our bodies, everything. Now, we're talking about how the human body and all biological organisms are made up of mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Um, and I want to discuss that there is... Um, yeah, so you said there are, there are a few things that um, <clears throat> perhaps you had missed in the second video that you wanted to clear up here in the third video. Yeah, well, one of the things was, I forgot to mention um, the organic molecules, the four types of organic molecules, and I was actually going to mention that right after I talked about this, and so the organic molecules, what organic means, it means living, I guess, it has the stuff, it has to do with life, so there's organic chemistry, that's a whole class in college that people who want to be doctors take, pre-med people take. And what it's called organic chemistry and what it's, it's basically organic chemistry is really just the study of carbon chemistry, the study of chemistry with carbon molecules. And remember I said carbon molecules is what makes up life. That's why it's called organic chemistry because organic has to do with life. <clears throat> so, um, there's four, uh, types of organic molecules though, that make up uh, organisms. Those are the carbohydrates. That would be the first square. So, you know, you hear about car carbohydrates. You eat carbohydrates. They give you energy. Um, the, the, you get the word carbohydrate from, there's a carbo, which means carbon. The hydrate is hydrogen. Water. Oh, hydrate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's water. It's water. It's H2O. Oh, okay. Um, that's the hyd hydrogen. Right. Um. And then there's the lipids. So lipids would be the second square. Lipids are the, the homeostasis. They, they are the, they maintain order. They're the fat. They're the storage. Right, there you go. So 
that would be the second square. And lipids are very similar to carbohydrates, but they are different. Um, yeah, I'll say. I mean, a lot of people s seem to think that they are pretty different um, in terms of their diets, the diets they go on. They try to cut out one or both or, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, lipids are fats. Right. Um, and they have different structures. Than the car, there's a different structure than the carbohydrate. Right, right, but they're but you're saying they're sort of related. They're they're sort of related. Yeah. yeah, there's there's a there's a commonality there, and then you get to the third one, and it's like completely different, right? Well, or, the third one's the proteins. Whoa, bless you, buddy. So you know about proteins. You know, people say make sure you eat your proteins if you work out. Uh, the proteins <clears throat> are made up of uh, what are the what are those things called? Amino acids. Amino acids make up proteins. Um, and the proteins are the doers. That's the third square. Mm. They're cr creating all this stuff. They're creating all the things in your body. They're doing all the work, pretty much. They're moving around, these proteins. Okay, and the uh, <clears throat> there's a, a fourth one, presumably. And then the fourth one's really different. It's weird. It's the nucleic acid. Hmm. Nucleic acids. And when I think of nucleic acid, I think of fire. I think of energy. Because, you know, I'm... I took these classes a really long time ago, and I haven't really f refreshed my memory and all this stuff. So right now, I'm kind of just going off of memory. But all I remember is that nucleic acids, they have to do with um, supplying energy to you. But I know that DNA, I think it was DNA and ATP. Well, the, the N and the A, what does that stand for in DNA? Uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. So yeah, yeah it's nucleic acid. Um and then ATP, um, ATP is the, gives you energy. That is basically just that. That's that's what gives you energy for your proteins to work, for your for your, your cells to work. And that's a nucleic acid. Um, so basically, there's four types of organic molecules. Now, speaking of DNA, you know, DNA people say that's the building block of life. Um, it's the code. It's the code from which life derives. So your proteins. They need to have something telling them what to do, and that's the nucleic acid, the DNA. And the proteins need to have some sort of instruction manual to tell it wh wh what we have to do. So what the that instruction manual is the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this was a huge thing when people discovered this DNA. And the big epiphany is people thought that you know something that had to make up all living organisms, they thought it was probably complex. At first they thought it was proteins that were doing all the work. And they, they, they people were just trying to figure out where are they getting the idea to do what they do? And then they figured out, okay, I guess it's DNA, uh, all this stuff comes from DNA. This is the, um, this is the instructions. This is where the instructions are coming from. And DNA is made up of four, I think they're called nucleobases. And you see, I took this class a long time ago, so I'm not super fresh on it, but it's A, which is adenine, C, which is cytosine, I think, G, which is guanine, and T, which is thymine. And these are the nucleobases, and from these four nucleobases, you get the code for all life. Every single organism uses these four nucleobases. Um, and that's a, a quadrant in and of itself, you're saying? That's a that's. That's a quadrant in and of itself, yeah. Mm. The Do you know the order in which they go, or have you thought about that? You know, I haven't really thought about, about it with these ones, but I think that I would put thymine in the fourth because, and I, I could get into why, but I'm not going to get into all the details of why right now, but I would put thymine in the fourth, and then there's a possible fifth, and that's urine. But the reason why I put that as a possible fifth, it's not in DNA. So there's no reason to put it as a possible fifth, but it's in RNA. Urine's in RNA. And RNA also is a nucleic acid. Ribo, ribonucleic acid. Um, but it's different from DNA. And it, so, it, so it may or may not, it's debatable as, as to whether it, it applies or not in, in terms of the same categorization. Yeah, it's the possible fifth, but it, it's not in DNA. So, you know, DNA is just 
DNA, which is really the building box of all life, or it, it gives instructions for building all life. So that's it's only made of four. So that's sort of like your basis for saying like the fifth is kind of the start of another quadrant, in a sense, right? Yeah, the fifth is out there. The fifth starts yeah. a new quadrant. Right. Okay. Uh, any other things that we we missed in the the first two goes and uh, that you want to clear up now? Yeah, well, one of them was I wanted to because now that we're just talking about life. Okay. Let's talk about tissues. The four types of tissues. Um, you have connective tissues, and I'll just I guess I could just read you what it is. Connective tissues are fibrous tissues. They are made up of cells. I'm reading off of Wikipedia by non-living material, which is called extracellular matrix connective tissue. Um, gives shapes to organs and holds them in place. Both blood and bone are examples of connective tissue. Uh, now, that's one type of tissue. Then they have the epithelial tissue. Uh, the epithelial tissue are formed by cells that cover the organ surfaces, such as the surface of skin. The airway is a reproductive tract, and inner lines of the digestive tract. The cells comprising epithelial are linked by via semi-permeable tight junctions. Hence, the tissues provides a barrier between the external environment and the organ it covers. In addition, in addition to the protective function, epithelial tissue may also be specialized to function in secretion and absorption. Epithelial tissue helps to protect organisms from microorganisms. So we start, we see the first two. The, the duality, the connective tissue and the epithelial tissue. The connective tissue, they're both kind of protective. Um, the tissue, the connective tissue, they're both kind of protective. Um, the epithelial tissue is the second, the second square because it's the most protective. It's the homeostasis. It's keeping the order. Then the third type of tissue is the muscle tissue. So this is the doer, the muscle part. This is where the actions come about. Okay. So muscle cells form the active contractile tissue of the body known as muscle tissue or muscular tissue. Muscle tissue functions to produce force and cause motion, either locomotion or movement with an internal organs. Muscle tissue is separated into three distinct categories. Okay. And then they have the fourth type of tissue, which is the nervous tissue. And that's the brain, what the brain's made up of. Um, so nervous tissue cells comprising the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system are classified as neural tissue. So these are the four types. And it's in that order of the squares. Um, connective is the first, epithelial the second, muscle the third, and nervous the fourth. Now, let's just give a few more examples just so... Well, what would the potential fit be there? You know, I don't know what the potential, if there is okay. a potential fit. There doesn't always have to be a potential fit. Okay. Um, I just thought I'd throw it out there just in case. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. All right. Well, no worries. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> what so, are you gonna? So let's let's look at the spine. Our spines, really quick. Okay. Um, so our spines are basically, are they call it the vertebral column? I guess it's made up of. So if you want to look at the picture, it. Oh, I can't really see it from here. I'm not sure. So it's basically uh, the quadrant model. You got the. Um, these different curves to the spine. The first part's the cervical curve, so that'd be the first square. The second square, the thoracic curve, and this is the protective part. The second part's always protective homo homeostasis. It maintains order structure. The third part is the lumbar curve, and then the fourth part is the sacral curve. And the fourth, it's called sacral. I guess that comes from the word sacred. The fourth is always transcendent. It's always different. And then there's, there is a possible fifth in the spine. There's a, there's a tailbone that's kind of separate from all of them, but people wonder if it, is, if it even is a possible fifth. But that's called the cosix. But they put here, they, they put only four parts. People say there's a possible fifth part, the tailbone. Um, okay, so there's, so there's many, many examples. There's many examples. In, uh, particular, particularly with regard to the human... Uh, physiology. Yeah, and, and I think that the significance of that is if you read Genesis, it talks about how, you know, people say, I guess that you could say this, that, you know, the man is made in the image of God. And, 
you know, I think that the it isn't a coincidence that the human really, really well in all aspects. And I, I could get into cellular respiration. I can get into the structures of all types of things. How the human in all aspects really seems to be revealing this pattern everywhere. Um, all right. So uh, what was that? Uh, I mean, was there anything else that you wanted to, to get into real quick? Because I know that you were eager to get to the definitions of the, the different quadrants. So do you want to... The names and definitions of... of the quadrants as you saw them, as you saw fit to, to name them or label them. So you want to start getting into that? You think that's good right now? Yeah, I think that's good for now. And if you think of anything else, we can get into that real quick. But um, I think people want to want to see like what else, what else does this entail? You know, like I'll give one more one, one more example because I want to just give this one more example and then we can get into the quadrant sure. definition. Sure. So the one more example I want to give is the domains of life because I like this one. Okay. So. There's four, there's three domains of life, but then there's a possible fourth once again. And the fourth is always really questionable. The remember, fourth or the fifth? The fourth. The fourth is questionable, but the fifth is extremely questionable. <laughs> but remember, dreaming, it doesn't seem to belong. Well, with the domains of life, it's archaea and eukaryotes. These are called prokaryotes. Archaea, I mean, archaea and bacteria are both called prokaryotes. And the reason why they're prokaryotes is they have prokaryotic cells, but prokaryotes can be divided into archaea and bacteria. Archaea would be the first square. Archaea are very, um, they live in extreme environments. Um, like in those ponds, those very hot ponds um, near volcanoes and stuff. I guess. Yeah, those th they're, they're called extremophiles, I think. So they live in extreme environments. And then there's bacteria. Bacteria... They break down things. I think of them as like homeostasis, as order. They break down um, dead things. They live in your stomach and they break down your food, things like that. Then there is the eukaryotes. So all, um, all organisms like this dog, we are eukaryotes. Yeah, plants, fungus, all those things. All the moving things. So the eukaryotes are kind of the movers and they have eukaryotic cells. So what differentiates them is they have different types of cells. And then there's the possible fourth, the virus. Now people say that the virus isn't really a, another domain, but some people do say it is another domain. And some people think that actually all these came from the virus. So there's different theories about this. So once again, remember the fourth is separate, but it encompasses all of them. Well, one of the main reasons why people think that the virus isn't another domain of life is because they say it's not even living because it needs to have a eukaryote or archaea or bacteria. It needs to have a host cell to live in. But that's the point. The fourth is separate but encompasses the other three. So it can't live without these other three, the virus. The other, and like I said, I, I watched this one show where people think that the virus kind of predates all of them. Yeah, like it's the, uh, the progenitor. Yeah, like the the primor the the most basic. And then there has been one time when people thought that they found a fifth domain of life, or yeah. or, or they would they would call it a fourth because a lot of people don't call the virus a domain of life, but because they don't think that the virus is living. But also, some people do think the virus is living. It's a, it's up to for the debate. But there was once a time when they thought they found another domain of life, but they haven't found it since. And what was that? I don't know what it was called, but they thought they found it apparently at the bottom of the ocean or something like that. Hmm. And it hasn't been found since. All right, so. So the fifth is always questionable. Okay. So. I got a dog crawling on me. Hey, what's up, Lucky? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> let's get into the. Uh... So let's get into these definitions. That's right. So let me ask you, Noah. So let's All let's right. do a little bit of uh, correspondence. Yeah. Why not? So, what's your definition of thinking? Um, my definition of thinking, huh? I don't know if I have one, but I, I suppose it could be... Uh, mm, well, like I said in the first video, it's sort of like ad hoc, you know, rationalizations for our behavior, you know, for what, for our choices, decisions, or, or, or the things that just happen, you know? Um, and thinking is sort of like the, 
the the way that we um, we kind of knit it into a narrative that that you know we consider uh, adequate or or sufficient, you know, for so that we can keep doing it. You know what I mean? So I guess thinking okay. is sort of like that, but I don't know. What's your definition? That's kind of interesting because it's very true. If I think about what I think about, which is called meta thinking, um, most of my thoughts are selfish. I think about how I can manipulate people. Um, I think about sex. I think about, um, and it, it, it's always very tied to my identity. So I think about it, it, it very, very tied to it. So if I consider myself, let's say, I consider myself uh, a basketball player. Or I can consider myself um, Jewish. I can consider myself white. I consider myself tall. I consider myself in this family. I consider myself, so I have all these different identities. And I think that these really shape my thoughts in a lot of ways. Um, mm. My, so my ego really affects my thoughts. Um, any other ideas about thoughts? So uh, get, maybe, Noah, give a more simple definition of thinking. Can you think of a more simple way of putting simple? it? Simple? Uh, I thought that was pretty simple. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, what, what are, what's sort of like the standard uh, definition of, of thoughts or thinking? It's like mental contents or something like that, right? Well, yeah, it's mental. And the first square we're going to get at, the first square is always mental. Um, now, one thing I want to get at, though, is when we do think, our thoughts are mostly in words. So when I think I'm thinking in words, I'm using language in my head. Oh, um, I'll, I'll just interject really quick uh -huh. and say that I recently read a, uh, a study that found out that Thinking in words is, um, it's all, it's sort of cultural in, in essence. So, uh, so people like, uh, Western, you know, European American students were more likely to think in words than, you know, Asian American students or something like that. I'll, I'll, I'll link true. you the study. I doubt that. Well, you don't have to say you doubt it, but I'll, I'll link you the study and you can, uh, peruse it. But. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's a little interesting. Um, it's relevant to what what you're saying here, I think. Well, then, well, how do they think if they're not thinking words? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I imagine they're not thinking then. Well, according to your definition, <laughs> maybe their mind is blank. I can think it's possible that their mind's blank, or maybe they're thinking in symbols. But you know. well, there's there's reason to think that this is true less and less as um, as you know the there's sort of like a, a globally homogenous you know, culture is sort of emerging, right? I don't think that that's true, but, you know. Well, your case could be made. I'm not saying it's true either. I think that a lot of people like to always do, like, oh, yeah, East for, you know, Eastern is, you know. Well, ooh, the fantasy. whole reason for that would be, um, I mean, they, I don't want to totally derail what you're getting into, but <laughs> but um, I, I think it the, the context in which I read it, it was... Um, you know, sort of like the the Confucian belt versus um, sort of like the the extrovert ideal of like the the Puritan work ethic and all that, and you know the industrialization of cities and so forth that took place, and uh, and how um, you know there there is a difference in temperament. This would be like temperament temperamentally, and. Uh, uh, you know, I can see that you disapprove, but <laughs> but there might be something there. That I don't understand do. what the Confucian belt is, but all I know the is Confucian that Confu belt. So, Confucius so, wasn't a, like a spectacular individual. Oh, I'm not saying he was. I'm just talking about descriptively. I'm not talking about prescriptively. So like descriptively, you know, what is Confucius about? It's about deference to authority. It's about group harmony. You know, all these things that I know and you know already. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so a lot of it is like, you know, if you if you're gonna say something, then it has to be, you know, concise and to the point and def deferential to whoever it is you're speaking to, and uh, but you know, and uh, 
Uh, you know, I can see that you disapprove, but <laughs> but there might be something there. That I don't understand see. what the Confucian belt is, but all I know the is Confucian that Conf belt. So, Confucius so, wasn't a, like a spectacular individual. Oh, I'm not saying he was. I'm just talking about descriptively. I'm not talking about prescriptively. So like descriptively, you know, what is Confucius about? It's about deference to authority. It's about group harmony. You know, all these things that I know and you know already. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so a lot of it is like, you know, if you if you're gonna say something, then it has to be, you know, concise and to the point and def deferential to whoever it is you're speaking to, and uh, but, you know, you come to America, and what what is the the ideal? It's you know you take initiative, and you know when someone who talks and talks quickly is seen as more intelligent than somebody who hardly speaks at all whereas it's sort of the it, you know i don't know if it still is or not but that's what the confucian belt is sort of in reference to it's like this this um attitude that uh you know to talk too much is sort of seen as you know a, a sign of foolishness you know well i think that that's actually really true here people notice that i think i, I know a lot of really dumb people that I grew up with, and they're really loud, because I don't really talk that much, you know, I don't really talk that much in real life, except for when I'm giving a lecture, but they tend to be loud, they tend to talk a lot, and they tend to be obnoxious. Yeah, so it's, you know, talking a lot is seen as <clears throat> talking nonsense, so I think, you know, that might have something to do with the, the study, where it's like, you know, the, when they, they don't, when they were vocalizing their <clears throat> thoughts, they were, they were performing more poorly than uh than i guess the their european american counterparts or something like that and that they were hypothesizing hypothesizing that that ha might have something to do with inborn temperament or not i don't know there's it's open to debate they think it's it's inborn like that they're genetically because they grew up in that culture for a while that they were kind of uh, adapted to be like that it's hard to say it's hard to say whether it's genetics or epigenetics you know it's or and what the difference is between those you know well, by epigenetics you're talking about cultural right right but anyway uh, keep going with what you were gonna so say. that's that's interesting stuff and I like to hear the all the different ways of looking at it so but nonetheless I, I think that what you're saying you know that, that that's interesting but I do know that there's been studies done that show that when people think, their vocal cords do move. And, you know, the only way that they can explain this is they're kind of sub-vocally speaking as they think. So they think of um, yeah, the guy, I think it was Wat Watts, not Watson. I think the Skinner. B.F. Skinner? The... B.F. Skinner. And what was the other guy's name? Something Watson. Watson. Or Pavlov. I, I forget. Pavlov, yeah, yeah. One of these Pavlov's guys, dogs. it wasn't Pavlov, but it was, no. I think his name was Watson. And it happens to coincidentally be the same name as the guy who came up with DNA, I think. But he, he discovered that when people are thinking, there's subvocalized speech going on. So he kind of connected thinking with words. So, you know, it is difficult to think about thinking without thinking with words. Because um, when I, you know, when I think, I'm often thinking with words. All right, okay. so, and like I said, my ego shapes my thoughts a lot. Right, so you're saying speech, <clears throat> or so thought is like sub-vocalized speech. Well, and it, that's not the complete definition, but a part of it is sub-vocalized speech, yeah. Okay. And, and, and it's, it's shaped a lot by my ego, my identity. Right. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to get into, into all this stuff too much, but, you know, there, there's a, the, there's a the stuff, there's these different studies like you know, I was I just been recently studying the stuff on like the bell curve, the book the bell curve, and they talk about different, you know, different races with different um, average IQs. That doesn't mean that everybody in a race has the same that IQ. It just means that that's the average. So, but you you would think that your physical, your physical affects your thoughts. So that you know, the the the, the people who are making the bell curve book, they claim to think that there's differences in racial groups and these physical differences perhaps in the brains and stuff like that create different IQs 
and they say that it isn't cultural at all. They say it's pretty much all genetic, the differences in IQs that you find in, among different racial or ethnic groups. Well, they probably say it could be explained genetically. You don't need to, to even talk about culture, so they don't. That's prob that's what my guess would be. I haven't actually read they, they, so I they, don't know. <laughs> they try to cut out all cultural influence. Right, right. And they basically they Because that that's that makes it more difficult to determine, you know, like that that may, that's a whole other can of worms. So they're trying to limit the Well they, of, they they make IQ tests and stuff so it's all so there's no cultural uh, component to it at all. Um and, and there's there yeah, so so basically they, they make it and I don't know how they do it, but they've come to the point where they're pretty sure it, it it's excluding all cultural influence and they think that IQ is basically genetic and then they say you know different groups of people different ethnic groups and stuff they have different IQs um, different intelligence now so your physical what they're getting at is they think that your physical your genes because your genes produces your physical they're saying that this is influencing the way that you think because your thinking is your intelligence. You know, well, it's not just influencing it. It's uh, determining it. Determining it. Yeah. So thought is very term determined by your physical. And that's very true. Thinking is a very physical thing because it has to do with your brain. And there's neurons in your brain and they're firing. I'm not going to get into all the details, but the neurons also have the four parts that are like the quadrant model. And... Um, but they're firing. They're firing action potentials. And when you're thinking, that's what's going on in your brain. Action potentials are firing and things are going on. Um, so it's thinking is a very physical thing. Um, now, what I was getting at is... Yeah. Okay. And I'm not going to get into all the whole the whole bell curve well, and all that stuff. So. I'll, I'll just yeah. say something. What? Um, really quick, just for the sake of argument, I guess. I don't know if it's uh, if it's true that thinking is is physical, because I mean normally, right? There's a there's a correlation between, uh, you know, the our mental activity and you know brain activity, right? Like yeah. neuro neurons firing and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Ordinarily, we observe a correlation, and that's you know to be expected, right? But um, I have read increasingly there's accounts of, you know, um, instances that are not ordinary, so extraordinary um, conditions under which that correlation is broken. So, for instance, with uh, like an out-of-body experience or like a near-death experience or something along those lines where, you know, somebody could register these, these intense um, experiences, these transpersonal experiences, and that have no correlation to any brain activity whatsoever. And, you know, it's, a, it's sort of like an anomalous thing as of right now, although a lot of people have put forth different hypotheses to explain that. So you're saying it doesn't necessarily, it's not completely f physical? It may not be, yeah. I mean, it's, it's debatable. That's what I'm saying. It, well, and the thing is that P scientists... There's some scientists that think it's completely physical. Yeah, sure. I'm not saying that they don't think that. I'm, I'm just saying that they may or may not be correct. Because what they find is, you know, when you have certain types of thoughts, they'll be associated with activity in a certain part of the brain. Um, so basically they think that your brain is what's producing your thoughts. Right. And that's. I think it's fair to say that that's sort of the scientific consensus as of right now, but that's... That doesn't mean that it's true, and that doesn't mean that that's not liable to change. So this is important because this third quadrant is the most physical quadrant. But we have to keep we have to keep in mind this is the first square of the third quadrant. So that's not the most physical square. It's the first square. The first square is always the most mental. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most physical. It's okay. physical. Thought is physical, but it's not super super physical. Okay, so what's the second square? The second square is emotion. Right, right, right. So this is the second square of the third quadrant. Now, what's your definition of emotion, Noah? Oh, goodness. Uh, emotion, well, I guess, you know, it's sort of like the folk definition would be like it's, it's a force that is felt, right? It's something that you feel. Uh -huh. And... Um, 
you know, it, it ranges from, you know, fear to, to anger to love or, uh, and joy, right? So, and, and anything, everything in between. Happy, sad, angry. Happy, sad, angry, fear. Surprise. Yeah, it's sort of like a felt response to, to stimulation. It's not necessarily, necessarily, you know, uh, mental in nature. It's more felt. It's more like feeling? Yeah, it's, okay. it's more immediately, it's more immediate, right? Because um, I feel like emotion is, is more, uh, it's more of a direct response and then the thought sort of comes next. You know, the thought comes later. But the emotion is, is what sort of, uh, that's sort of like, how one navigates um, the the the, stimu uh, the stimuli one one uh, comes across, and then the the thought sort of comes after the fact, as what I, what I call you know ad hoc rationalizations. That's sort of how I tend to see it, but you know I'm open to uh, I'm open to different interpretations as well. Okay. Anything else with that? I can't really think of anything. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not I'm not too wedded to that, but what do you think? Well, it's interesting that you think that emotions comes before thought. Some people would think that thought comes before emotions. Our thoughts Well they emotions. certainly there there seems to be an interplay, right? There's an interplay. Yeah. And that's the whole reason why they're a duality. Right. And a lot of times people for instance, you know, I I did there was this one rabbi that, that I talked to. Right. And he's very into the difference between thoughts and emotions. And he thinks that you should only be about thoughts. And emotions are bad. Right, like emotions are not to be trusted. They're not, well, yeah. Right, and thoughts are, you know, logic and, you know, you know, they're, they provide structure but, and all that kind but of But they don't know anything about thinking and emotion at all. And this is the way most people are. Because thoughts and emotion are so interconnected and there's nothing special about thoughts. My thoughts are not that special. You know, I, I have, when I contemplate, I contemplate about some things, but... Like I said, most thoughts are selfish. Let's be honest here. And there's nothing special about thoughts. My thoughts are not that special. You know, I, I have, when I contemplate, I contemplate about some things, but like I said, most thoughts are selfish. Let's be honest here. Right, you know, I'm hungry, you know, I should get food. And then you started thinking about, you're imagining what you could do to obtain that, to fill that need, right, or, or that desire. Yeah. And... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when my thinking is sort of colored by the same thing, and it's it's pretty easy to notice when I'm doing that. But sometimes you're not even paying attention. I think. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so, oh, and, and then and then another thing that I want to say is that there people say that your limbic system, and I'm not going to explain about all this. In this all fits the quadrumal to the parts of your brain within, but the limbic system they say is responsible for emotion. Well, that's very connected to the cortex and even intertwined with it. And so people say that thoughts and emotions aren't just separate. They're so interlinked. Right. They're all, you, they almost could be the same thing. Almost the same thing, they although they say they are different. Um, so <clears throat> now one thing I want to mention is that once again, emotion is very physical. A lot of right. people... It's a visceral kind of response. Right? It's a visceral response, yeah. It's extremely physical because emotions apparently come from hormones in your body, which are physical phenomena. The secretion of hormones. So when I'm feeling these things, it's because hormones are being secreted. And also neurotransmitters in my brain are being secreted. Like dopamine, and this is making me feel happy. Or serotonin, and this is making me feel a certain way. That's why people take drugs to manipulate these systems to give themselves different emotions. Right, so, so they can uh, feel something different. So you can feel something different. That's right. So it's a very physical thing. Um, now, like I said, there's the emote, motion. There's the motion part. That's the root word in it. Right, it's Ca always changing, right? To it's cause changing. motion. It's very changeable. That's another thing about emotion is it never lasts. And neither do thoughts. For neither, that do, neither do thoughts. You yeah. see, this is a third quadrant. Constant movement. Constant things going on. Okay. In the third quadrant. Because the third quadrant is the doing quadrant. Okay. 
So this is the first quadrant. So the first quadrant is is what is what what for in we, what order? We're, we're gonna get to that hopefully later. We okay. have to first go through these. Well, I figured we can we can just re reiterate really quickly the first quadrant, the second quadrant, and now we're in the third quadrant. We're in the third quadrant right now, yeah. Yeah. So the first quadrant really quickly is what. I want to get to that later because right, I don't want to get people all into the, so okay all right fine don't so, listen to me <laughs> so so then so then one other thing I want to mention though yeah that's just fine is that emotions are very shaped by the ego too so my identity is going to really affect my emotions so once again if I consider myself a basketball player and I have a big basketball game then I'm gonna be nervous I'm gonna be scared and because my ego is a part of this um, and you know, emotions are very tied to mating. So I, I see a, a beautiful woman. I go up to her. This is me. I need to keep my genes going. So I'm getting really scared right now. And then she likes me. Oh man, I'm starting to feel happy. My ego is very tied to my emotions. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's all kinds of tangents we can go off. We can go off on a lot of tangents, <laughs> but, you know... Let's I'll, try to keep it. I'll, I'll just go off, I'll do one more. Let's say that I consider myself a pygmy. I'm not a pygmy. But let's say you consider yourself... I consider myself a pygmy. Um, and somebody comes up to me and says, Hey, Ryan, pygmies are stupid. They have the lowest IQ of all... That's going to make you mad, man. ...types of people. Right? I'm going to be really upset if I'm a pygmy, probably, if, if I'm intelligent enough if to, you, to if realize. If you think of yourself as a yeah, pygmy. Yeah, if I think of myself as a pygmy. If you identify. If I identify that way. Mm -hmm. Unless unless I'm a self-hating pygmy. Really? So that maybe would make some me feel good. Yeah, then it would make me feel good. Really? Or it would, maybe it would confirm your what you already think to be true. So you, you yeah. think you're smart. Because of that, or something like that. Well, I, I know a Filipino guy, and and he says that he hates Filipino people. Um, I know a lot of Filipino people that really, really love Filipino people. So there is a little bit of differences in in that in that aspect. But also, the Filipino guy that didn't like Filipino people, he he was about he like he liked basketball, and he was more into he was kind of more gangster. Actually, there's a lot of Filipino people who are like that. I don't know, <laughs> but. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is our identity affects our emotions. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, could yeah. we understand this. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Moving on. We have emotions, then we have doing. So emotions creates movement. Emotions causing movement causes us to do things. Doing is the most physical. Doing is just action. Physical action. The dog just let out a nasty fart. Oh, did he? Well, yeah. I'm glad we uh, immortalized it on camera. All right. But so doing, um, usually you do things to accomplish goals. I don't smell anything. Okay. Maybe, maybe I will later. Maybe I will see. But um, it's just pure action. To do is just, there's nothing else a part of it. What the person is doing is just the, the physical thing. So this is the third square of the third quadrant. The most physical of them all, doing. Right, right. That's pure action. Yeah, and, and once again, your physical is going to affect what you do. So if you're seven foot tall, then you're probably going to be more likely to Play do basketball. basketball. Yeah, to slam dunk. Yeah, stuff like that. Right, so what you're saying is the actual physical structure of your body... Um, does influence your future actions, right? Or or the, the, the range of actions that you can accomplish. Yeah, attributes, yeah. It influences it. Your physical. So, and this is the most physical quadrant. And this is the most physical square of the most physical quadrant. Interesting. So then, any, oh, any definition of doing, what's your definition of doing? Uh, I think we already covered that. We covered yeah, that well. it's just pure action. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Doing is just um, action on a material plane, or what what we think of as a material plane, or you know, physical. Um, so it's a it's almost a tautology, right? Because it's you know, action is physical. 
it's sort of a tata. It's like it, it's sort of invoking itself to support itself. Mm-hmm. You know, you know what I mean. I I don't know what that means, but uh, well, it's not it's not too terribly important, but it's it's basically like a um. What do you mean by tautology exactly? Tautology, like uh, like it it so. I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't really think of one right now, but but saying okay, so you know, physical um, is it's like saying you know the so one so what the physical is is you know physical action. It's like it's basically saying what it is. It's defining itself as itself essentially. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that later. But you, for anyone else, you could look it up <laughs> if you really want to. It's just, it's just uh, basically a, a term that I know of from logic. Okay. I think. Mm-hmm. All right. So, how much time do we, have we been going? Well, we're at about forty-five minutes. So let's probably stop at fifty-five minutes. Well, we'll stop soon. But we'll stop um, soon. We'll just, we'll just we'll just do dreaming, and then we're gonna continue. Okay. Okay. So, what's your definition of dreaming? Dreaming, I'm not sure. Dreaming is one of those things that's kind of a mystery, right? Because it's like, we don't know for sure if when one's dreaming, um, you know, it be, it's, it's hard for us to tell. I mean, because experientially, how does one determine when one is not dreaming? Hmm. You know what I mean? Hmm. It's, uh, we, the way that we determine when one is not dreaming is, you know, from a kind of a third person perspective, you know, from, from, you know, the perspective of an observer, but experientially it's like, it's very difficult to determine. Right. So it's, it's one of those things that, that it's hard to say whether or not, you know, I, how do I know that I'm not currently dreaming right now, you know, from, from kind of a philosophical, kind of almost like a solipsistic, I don't know. I don't know how I, how I know it. I just sort of take it on faith. I just sort of take it on faith that I'm not, right? I, 